So, uh, good mm -hmm. afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the CFTC seminar. Today uh, is my pleasure to present Professor Mauro Doria from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro <coughs> in Brazil. Uh, Mauro did his PhD in the Yale University, and uh, he was a postdoc in the University of Florida and in Los Alamos uh, National, um, National um, Laboratory. Um, he was a visiting professor in the University of uh, Antwerp in Belgium and University of Cameroon in Italy. And currently, uh, he is um, a full professor in, in, the of, uh, in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Um, so um, I had the pleasure to be advised by Professor Maradora during my master in PhD studies. And he kindly agreed to, um, to present in our seminar today on um, on the spin momentum uh, locked state. So, um, Professor Mauro, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. It's quite a pleasure to be here um, giving this uh, sem seminar. And in fact, it's an honor. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I hope that you will find interesting this uh, subject if you don't work on it, at least as a, um, uh, say, um, cultural, um, say, addition to your uh, knowledge in physics of uh, current things that are going on in um, condensed matter physics, uh, electronic systems. So I'm going to share my screen. I think that's the next step, right? Let's see. Uh, Share. I hope that you are seeing it. And, uh, uh, yeah, I can see all those slides together. Yes, I, st I still have to put them apart here. Yeah, you can see. Uh, but you can see. Uh, like this, I'd rather show it. Sure, like yes, this. one big and one small. Exactly. Now it's good. Is it okay like this? Can you see it? Yes, now it's, uh, it's perfect. I have a slide science, uh, uh, University of uh, Lisbon, uh, Faculty of Science uh, of the University of Lisbon. And my seminar is entitled Properties of the Spin Momentum Locked State. Okay. Uh, well, so I want to thank uh, Rodrigo Coelho for uh, this kind invitation. And especially, I also would like to thank uh, my collaborator, Edinardo Rodriguez from Instituto Federal Baiano, Brasilia. He is on the audience and uh, uh, halfway between uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro and uh, Lisbon. He is in Recife, more or less halfway. So th this is, is um, I will show some radical new approach to two-dimensional topological states. Okay, uh, so let's see the time so that I control it. Okay, time moment I'm starting. So, uh, I mean, I, I have had a couple of uh, collaborators on this uh, uh, project that has evolving since uh, nearly 10 years ago. Okay. And um, Edinado is uh, one of the uh, main, um, is the main person uh, helping to move on with these ideas right now. Okay, so um, the first thing that I want to call your attention is that uh, condensed matter physics has acquired a new dictionary of words. And often you open a paper and you have like no idea of what's going on. Things have changed so much. You see conferences and it's the same situation. People talk about uh, topological insulators, berry phase, spin helical Dirac, spin momentum locking, SARPES, uh, SARPES we, we understand right now, is spin and angle resolved photoemission spectroscopy. Magnetic monopoles, spin orbit interaction, which is also, also known as a Grashba term, breaking of time reversal symmetry, 
electron backscattering, Dirac cone, vial equation, magnetic monopoles, quantum anomalous how effect, bismuth based cogenides, co uh, also the silver ones, and so on and so on. I just listed a few ones, and they are very confusing. Okay. So I, uh, I will not be able to go through and explain all this, even because this vocabulary has been changing through the years. But I will give you to a personal uh, view of some important uh, things that uh, are appearing in the literature. And one of them is exactly this, the spin momentum locking condition, okay? So if we go back to uh, 2009, which is a long time ago, we have this paper, which is um, about this uh, uh, compound bismuth 2 uh, tellurium 3, which is uh, known as telluride of bismuth, okay? In this paper in uh, 2009, if you look what's written here, you see that uh, it's, um, unless if you are very much into it, you cannot understand anything. Helical Dirac fermions, charge carriers that behave as massless relativistic particles with an intrinsic angular momentum spin locked to its translational momentum are proposed to be the key to realize fundamental new phenomena in condensed matter physics. Prominent examples, anomalous quantized magnetoelectric coupling have fermion states that are the on antiparticles, charge frac 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 fractionalization in a bose einstein condensate and so forth. And they study this uh, uh, substance, this compound, because they say that the helical nature of the surface electron is very clear there. So if you go to Wikipedia, can you hear me? Yes. If you if you go to uh, Wikipedia and search for helical Dirac states, you find this definition: uh, helical Dirac fermion is a charge carrier that behaves as a massless relativistic particle with its intrinsic spin locked to its translational momentum. It's basically um, uh, removed from the the paper. Okay, but it is there. In fact, I mean uh, the vocabulary has been changing so much that this word helical is not used anymore, in my opinion, unless by a few. So what have they discovered? They have discovered that spin is perpendicular to momentum, to the wave number. So let's recall, for instance, the Fermi surface, okay, as being a circle. What's the Fermi surface? All electrons in the material have a momentum k, a wave number k, in this k, points, uh, it's like a, a, in the radial direction, uh, and the few states uh, up to the Fermi surface, okay, here. So if you uh, keep in mind that the momentum, so is uh, in the radial direction. They have me measured with the SARPES and found out that in, the, in two borders of the Fermi surface, the spin is perpendicular to it because if the spin is, is, is like in this green arrow, it means that momentum is perpendicular, okay? So S is perpendicular to K. So in fact, here are the measurements they have even with uh, some doped uh, uh, material, but uh, you see the red arrows sh show the spin, okay? And this is the Fermi surface because if you look at the axis, it's KY, k x okay so the momentum the wave number is in the radial direction okay and here is the measurement i mean they have a, a dirac cone that i will explain that's the fermi surface and they find out that in um, one direction this people are this p is polarized in this direction in one angle and in the other one is polarized in the opposite direction they have a, here the measurements okay uh <clears throat> with respect to Kx, and they see that it's according to that. So what they observed is that is that the detection of spin momentum locking of spin helical Dirac electrons, okay, with um, uh, spin resolved ARPES. ARPES is a technique that allows you to find out what's the momentum of each particle inside the material. And it, it's a technique that works very well in surfaces, okay. 
So bismuth telluride is, uh, has been studied since then. That's a 2009 paper. Here we're talking about July 2021, and it goes on. Here they try to predict the um, um, monolayers with some orthorhombic structure with first principles. I'm not, I'm not going to discuss this and not get into details, but if you, if you look at here, it's interesting to read it. The bismuth-based calcogen ion compounds, particularly bismuth 2 S3, S selenium-3, and tellurium-3, have gained special interest due to, the, to their um, rivaled electronic, thermoelectric, and optical properties, such as low thermal conductivity, large seabed coefficients, small effective carrier masses, and thickness-dependent um, bands. Therefore, bismuth calcogenides compounds are suitable for a wide variety of applications, including thermoelectric energy conversion, spintronics, infrared photography, photosensitivity, and optical devices. So this is the world of um, uh, topological insulators. No? And uh, so here he, he says that the, 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 uh, uh, bismuth telluride has gathered a great attention in physics and uh, material science because of its exotic electromagnetic properties, including magnetic monopoles and superconductivity proximity effect. Okay, and they show a strong spin orbit induced indirect bulk energy gap semiconductors. So that's another paper, a recent one that uh, people um, claim that there is a, a giant spontaneous how effect. As we know, the how effect needs a perpendicular applied magnetic field. So here they take this compound, cerium bismuth palladium, okay, and observe vial nodes, singularities of the Berry curvature. Okay, I'm throwing these words on you to see how the nomenclature is being used in, 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 in this area, in this sub area of condensed matter physics. Okay, electric current is deflected by a magnetic field. Okay, this is the whole effect. An exotic metal made of cerium bismuth and palladium was examined, examined, and a giant Hall effect was found to produce to be produced by the material. In the total absence of any magnetic field, the reason of this is that the electrons behave as magnetic monopoles on it. Okay. That's also very strange and not well understood. But here I'm talking about experimental papers. So experimentalists are searching for words to try to understand what they observe. And they reach to the, uh, these uh, um, uh, concepts like magnetic monopoles that uh, were in the domain of uh, theoretical physics, okay? So this is uh, the layer, the bismuth, uh, uh, telluride of bismuth, bismuth, bismuth telluride has a layered comp structure. That's a kind of, uh, um, um, say common. I, I'm saying that in fact, it's for all these topological materials, they are really two dimensional. When they are three dimensional, they really mean something in a surface. Um, now a little bit of, uh, um, say, information, uh, parallel information for you, which is interesting to be aware of it. Bismuth seems to be a very strange uh, atom <clears throat> for reasons that are not completely understood, but they are, all these uh, topological materials, usually they involve, involve bismuth, not all, but uh, many of them, okay? And interesting that if you go back to 1952, you find out the mean free path of bismuth is very large. This is a work by Sondheimer, published in 1952, and essentially what the, he finds is that the, the free path, the mean free path of bismuth is of, of the order of 10 to the minus four centimeter, which is one micron, which is 20 times larger than that of silver, which by itself, if you look back, back down here in the yellow, in yellow, it has a large mean free path, okay? All the compounds uh, like, um, um, Aluminum that drops very quickly, okay? But uh, for some reason, bismuth has a very large number, okay? Um, and that is probably not 
uh, under, were still completely understood. Um, they say that is uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, the claim here is low electrons are prevented by conservation loss from interacting with any, but the longest lattice vibration. But that's a story that is not well uh, told yet. Okay, and that's is a paper by Pipper in 1952. Uh, in fact, uh, um, uh, is confirming what Sondheimer had said uh, previously, that the electronic mean free path of bismuth is extremely large and of order of one micron at room temperature, okay? So it says that uh, they say that, uh, well, the mean free path uh, is uh, very large, but the number of available electrons for conduction is low in bismuth. So that's an interesting information. Well, now we go to 2018, okay? And we find that the spin momentum locking is also found, was also found in high TC superconductors. That's a very strange thing. So if you look at this high TC superconductor, bismuth 2212, okay, that's the name, it's strontium, calcium, copper, oxygen, so far. Okay, it's a layered compound with planes of copper oxygen. Okay, and they apply the SARS, SARPES, which is a spin resolved um, photoemission uh, spectroscopy. They find out that uh, uh, the spin is also perpendicular to momentum. Uh, this is, you should interpret, this is the gamma point. This is, you should interpret the momentum in wave number space. So really the wave number is pointing um, in the radial direction, okay, or pointing outwards in such a way that it is always, the spin is always perpendicular to, our, to it. So uh, Lanzara, which is the head of this uh, group, Alessandro Lanzara, says, in other words, we discovered that there was a well-defined direction in which electron, each electron was pointing given its momentum, a property also known as spin momentum locking, said Lanzara. Finding it in high temperature superconductor conductors was a big surprise. <coughs> Spin momentum locking has also been claimed in other areas like in optica, okay, in evanescent waves. So they show that the existence of inherent property of evanescent electromagnetic waves. Spin momentum locking, where the direction of a momentum fundamentally locks the polarization of the wave. Okay. I'm not gonna get in, into this because I even myself don't know much, okay? Okay, so that's the situation. It seems uh, I'll take that this uh, spin momentum locking is something important and we'll try to explore that. But before I do it, I want to go to some further re review back in the past about Dirac particles via equations and symmetries, okay? Uh, to begin with, I, I want to make it clear what I mean by these things. For instance, the Vio equation is equation that you have a velocity, the Pauli matrices, the momentum applied to the wave function, and this gives the energy times the wave function. And V0 is a velocity, okay? So the Pauli matrices, uh, you can square, you can solve this equation and you want to find the energy eigenvalues, you just square, okay? And then essentially sigma P, squared gives you uh, p squared, okay? This is just a property of Pauli matrices. You have two Pauli matrices. You take the commutator or anti-commutator. You take this expression. You write the equation squared in this way. And then you find out that only this term contributes because pi pj gives p squared and this is anti-symmetric gives zero. So in momentum in space, p is equal to h over i gradient. So if you take a wave function of this kind, you find out that P is H bar times K. And then you find out that you have a linear direct uh, spectrum because you take the square root and your energy is proportional to the momentum, okay? That's the linear direct equation. Interesting, if you go back to 2010, we are talking about now of 11 years ago, um, there were papers uh, claiming and um, there are lots of researchers, uh, published uh, research indicating that iron-based superconductors 
are the last example of Dirac physics. Cooperant superconductors have also Dirac nodes. Graphene, which is well known to have these Dirac fermions. Topological insulators that we were just talking about. Iron-based superconductors. So Dirac fermions present in all these materials are fascinating examples of how different systems can lead to similar profound low energy electronic behavior, okay? So if you go to, um, now we go to a little bit of theory. If we go to graphene, okay? Um, we found out the graphene, uh, electrons in graphene obey the Dirac equation. How do you uh, know that? Uh, well, uh, in theory, you just say that uh, you have a Hamiltonian that um, uh, allows hopping from just uh, nearest neighbors uh, in a um, hexagonal lattice, which is a form of graphene, it's hexagonal. So you can divide into green and orange, like in this picture here. And they hop from orange to green, green to orange, and so forth. So you have two lattices, A and B, and then you write this Hamiltonian of hopping terms from A to B and to B, from B to A, okay? And then if you go to the continuum, you find out that this nearest neighbor hopping between two distinct um, um, lattices, nets, uh, is essentially collapses into this Hamiltonian here, VF sigma P, okay? However, notice that it, what is called Pauli matrices here is a way to handle the two lattices, the two uh, triangular lattices here. It has nothing to do with spin. We can, we see, we can find, can show that uh, it cannot be spin. At least uh, if you propose a Hamiltonian like that, we are going to in fact show that it's possible to have a vial Dirac equation, but that's not the Hamiltonian. That's my point here, okay? So that is very important. And uh, even before graphene, we're talking about 1998, Abrikosov had proposed that silver calcogenides, which are those layered, com also layered compounds, they have a, a linear magneto resistance, okay? That uh, Abrikosov said, I mean, these, it's unusual magneto resistance, linear magnetic field and positive, okay? He claims that the way to explain this behavior is by proposing a Hamiltonian, which is nothing but the Dirac equation, the Dirac vial equation, okay? And here you don't have a, a hexagonal lattice. So, um, uh, but it, yeah, still sigma cannot be spin. It can be some isospin, spin, some tricky way to deal with the system that is not known, okay? We're going to discuss this. And even in 1999, um, Abrikosov came back to this idea to explain uh, again the linear magnetic resistance, also observed in rare earth diantimonides. Okay, it's a graphite like, it's like a gra graphite. So even before graphite, Abrikosov had the suggestion that you, what you have is a linear Dirac equation. Okay, so what's vial fire fermions? Let's recall history. One year after the publication of the Dirac equation in uh, uh, 28, Weil realized that the, the Dirac equation could be broken into two pieces, independent one, if the mass of the particle was zero, okay? So he proposed it, um, that massless particles can be described by two by two Hamiltonians, either this one or this one here, okay? And this has to be, has to be uh, <clears throat> is connected to the chirality of the particle. This is right-handed quarks, or could be left uh, neutrinos and left-handed uh, particles, okay? So this term uh, 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 was, uh, this Hamiltonian is uh, proposed by Weil. But however, in space, in say relativistic physics, you can propose a Hamiltonian like that because you are breaking some symmetries, okay? On this matter, the situation is a little bit more tricky, okay? So uh, let's see, for instance, uh, parity and reflection symmetry. 
Uh, here I'm uh, interested in, in the physics of a two-dimensional layer, conducting layer in coordinates x1 and x2, okay? So I have the concept of top and bottom, okay? Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is parity and reflection symmetry. Parity is when you, you take uh, one point in space and put all of its coordinates negative. You cannot go from this point to this by a simple rotation, okay? In two dimensions you can, but in three you cannot. You cannot rotate, make a rotation and go from this to that. So this is it's two independent systems, which is left and right-handed systems, okay? However, you can go from a, a, a parity transformed point into a reflection symmetry by a rotation because minus X1 minus X2, you can rotate, okay? This can be a simple rotation. So in, in, in other words, what I'm saying is that parity and reflection are the same symmetry apart from a rotation. So they are the same thing. Parity is more interesting to uh, high energy physicists. Reflection symmetry is more interesting for two dimensional conducting layers, of course, okay? Uh, so parity breaking is the breaking of reflection symmetry along a layer, okay? So we will see that spin momentum locked states, they break the reflection symmetry along a layer, okay? Uh, before I do that, I just want to call your attention that uh, spin momentum locking is uh, zero helicity because angular momentum is the sum of uh, orbital angular momentum and um, uh, spin, okay, uh, angular momentum, okay. Helicity is the angular momentum along the uh, momentum. If so, if you project G, total angular momentum in P, the, the angular part does not contribute and you are left just with spin, okay? So this is uh, what justifies the term helical, okay? You are talking about the elicity, in fact, okay? So let's review under a parity or reflection on a layer operation. So if you, if you move, uh, if you take an operation like that, position goes into minus X, momentum goes into minus P. Just think in terms of the derivative, the X dt, okay? Angular momentum in spins, so they are vectors. The vector picks up a sign negative. The angular momentum, the spin are pseudo vectors. They don't pick up a sign because here you have X and P and both have a negative sign. So it does not change. If it does not change, the spin should not change either because it's an angular momentum, okay? So the elicity is a pseudo scalar. That's the important thing because the spin has not changed its sign but the momentum has, cha has changed. So helicity is a pseudo scalar. In conclusion, in a helical state, that is a spin momentum locked state, symmet parity symmetry is broken. The vial Hamiltonian, and then I'm talking about real spin times momentum, does not exist because the helicity is a pseudo -sc scalar and the Hamiltonian must be a scalar. Okay. So this is not possible unless if this is not real spin. That's the reason they proposed in graphene. Okay. Let's see how the uh, uh, fields behave uh, under uh, parity. Let's review that. For this, it's nice to take the uh, Newton's law for a particle in a magnetic field, electric, electromagnetic field. Here's the electric field, here's the magnetic field. This is the X dt. So if you change X into minus X, you have a sign here, you have a sign here. So the electric field has to change sign, okay? But the magnetic field does not change sign, okay? Under X into X. And so the then the magnetic field is like the spin itself. It's like the angular momentum, okay? It's a pseudo vector. Under time reversal, we have the opposite. You have here no change of sign. Here we have a change of sign. So the magnetic field picks up a sign and the electric field does not, okay? So from parity, the electric field is a vector, but the magnetic field is a pseudo vector. Then I'll take, a, um, I'll make a um, hypothesis that will be discussed in the next uh, slides. That a state with definite helicity breaks the reflection symmetry that we know it because it's a pseudo scalar. 
And so it allows for the spontaneous onset of a magnetic field, which is a pseudo vector. So all that I'm saying is the following. Since elicity has screwed up uh, reflection symmetry, then we can have a magnetic field, why not? This is all I'm saying. I'm not saying that we must, must have, I'm saying that it's possible, okay? So what I'm going to say is that there is a local magnetic field associated with spin momentum locking, okay? So the spin momentum locking that I'll take from this point on is a condition like that. That's the Pauli matrices. This is the momentum. This is this physical state and it's equal to zero. You say, oh, if it's equal to zero, you are not breaking because it does not have a, a definite value of sigma dot P. Okay. If you want, you can take a, a margin of very small value. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking that this equation does break reflection symmetry. Okay. And now the momentum that I'm taking is the gauge invariant momentum. So I'm heading to physics. <clears throat> so notice, I mean, how nice this argument that I'm going to describe to you is. There is a divergence list field associated to that equation that I just gave you of um, spin momentum locking, okay? And this divergence field is psi conjugate sigma psi. So this is, is a consequence of that equation. That's simple to see. You just uh, compose this identity here, okay? Which takes the um, zero felicity or uh, spin locking phase equal to zero, and this is obviously equal to zero. But if you stretch out, you put the I here, the vector potential in everything, you see that vector potential cancels out and the I, which is here, changes sign in such a way that what you get is this identity, which is nothing but the divergenceless field that I just told you. So the first thing that you say, well, I have found that there is a conserved current. No, it's not a, a conserved current. It's really a local magnetic field. And this equation is telling you that the divergence of the magnetic field is equal to zero, which is one of the Maxwell's equation. If this is a magnetic field, of course, through Ampere's law, you have a conserved current, which is given by that. Okay. How, how do you know that this is a magnetic field? And that's my point here. The divergenceless field can be seen to be a local magnetic field from the three term decomposition of the kinetic energy. So there's something deep in uh, next. So that, that's the equations. I mean, just before I go into the kinetic energy, just to um, review what we have shown is that this condition implies in this, in this local magnetic field, in fact, it has this form here with a very well defined constant, multiplying constant. Okay, and uh, from that, it satisfies magnetostatics equation. Uh, often, uh, sometimes I define H prime as the, being the, uh, the local field removed of a possible applied field. Okay. So what is this third term decomposition that is able to show that this, this is a, a local magnetic field? Uh, the three term decomposition of the kinetic energy is something that tells you, tells you that the kinetic energy, the standard kinetic energy, I will explore this in more details, okay, um, is uh, the sum of uh, three terms. One, which is the uh, spin momentum locking. The other is the spin orbit, which is the Rashba. And the other is a uh, spin local field interaction. So what I'm saying is that the Rashba term, which is the spin, orbit coupling is contained in the Schrodinger kinetic energy, something that is largely ignored in the literature, but it's true, okay? Or proven, the people have to prove us wrong, okay? And we will see that this spin momentum locking condition lowers the kinetic energy. You will understand all this in a moment. So what I'm saying is very simple and very important and profound. Take the kinetic energy as being this one, that's the kinetic energy that we all know it. It's quadratic in the momentum, okay? However, the uh, states, they have spin. There is a spin here, okay? 
what I'm saying is that you can prove, and that's not difficult. It's, it's, in fact, it's very simple, but I will not be able to do it here because it's, uh, it will consume some of my time. That this kinetic energy is equal to the square of the spin momentum locking equation, the Rashba term, which is spin times momentum. Okay, this is a divergence. Uh, divergence. So uh, if you integrate in space, we will take as a contribution of uh, just a layer. Now I'll think of a layer, and the space is sectioned by this layer, and there is the part up and down that must be treated independently. Okay, and also I have this curvature term. So this is an identity, is a theorem. It's not a good, an, a, a, an approxi good approximation. No, it's a identical. So what I'm saying is the following. In fact, here's for a layer, I, I decompose the Rashba term. It's the well-known x3 hat dot sigma cross p term, okay? Uh, and uh, let's move on. The time is short. Okay, uh, why it's a magnetic, that's a divergence field, divergence-less field is a magnetic field. Okay, let's obtain the current. If we, how do we obtain it? We take a variation usually proportional to the vector potential into the kinetic energy. The, the, the traditional kinetic energy will give me this form of the current. That is the Schrodinger current that we all know. If I'm telling you that there is a, another way to write the kinetic energy, I can do the same trick and obtain a new formulation of the current. And what I obtain is this expression here, which has sigma dot p psi and has this uh, curl term, okay? Notice that if I take spin momentum locking, this is zero. And then my current is the curl of something. So if I look at Ampere's law, curl of local h for 4 pi over Cj, I'll find out if I put it here that I can solve exactly Ampere's law and I obtain the local magnetic field as being this one. Okay, so it's guaranteed that this is a local field, even because the divergence of H is equal to zero, thanks to the spin momentum locking condition. Okay, that's the local field. Okay, so what I'm saying here, I'm saying that the kinetic energy is composed of three terms. If we, let's go look at the symmetry uh, breaking and the parity or reflection, okay? X into minus X, P into minus P, okay? So uh, the elicity breaks parity, but in the kinetic energy, it appears squared, so it doesn't matter, okay? It can be like that in the Hamiltonian. The local magnetic field, which is pseudo-scalar, breaks parity, okay? It, it does not pick a sign. That's, a, you must keep in mind the scalar, so the scalar picks a sign, the pseudo vector does not pick a sign, okay? So it does not pick a sign, but sigma also does not pick. So none of these terms break uh, reflection symmetry. Obviously it has to be such because if I say that this is identical to the uh, original kinetic energy, no, no term here can break reflection since the original one does not, okay? So all terms are invariant and including this one because P goes into minus P, sigma goes into sigma, and this uh, gradient goes into minus, so it cancels out the sign. So that's a, 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 the scenario here is the following. If I choose a state that satisfies this equation, it's like uh, I'm choosing a ground state with less symmetry than the energy. That's what we know from the Ising model. Now, uh, you just take a, uh, uh, the ground state can be all spins up or all spins down. So it breaks the invariance of the interaction, though the Hamiltonian does not. So that's what I'm saying here. You break the symmetry, okay? So spin momentum lock, locking breaks reflection symmetry, but the kinetic energy is kept invariant. In this context, vial states are possible because it doesn't matter under this mechanism because what I'm saying is that this takes a, 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 a particular value, okay? Uh, that can be equal to zero or who knows, maybe not equal, identical to zero. If it's equal to zero, we see that minimizes the kinetic energy that this becomes, this becomes equal to zero. 
Okay, let's go to the Dirac linear uh, spectrum. Okay, uh, the Dirac linear spectrum. Uh, sorry. Um, we go back to our original kinetic energy. Okay, we go back to its dual view. Now, if we introduce, I say no, my side is such that these equations are satisfied. Okay, the uh, Ampere's law and also the spin locking condition. If I feed this into this Hamiltonian here, of course, this term will be equal to zero. This will be a quartic term here. And the uh, Rashba term, which is this one here, will become a term like this, the Laplacian psi conjugate psi integrated in space. But this is what I'm saying, space is sectioned here by the layer. So this Laplacian really acts on uh, the third direction, okay, perpendicular to the layer in infinity and in the layer itself, okay? And in fact, I'm not going to get into details, but it's, possible to show that this um, term here, which in fact is attractive, attractive, is small, okay? Because here you have something that appears that's proportional to the electron classical radius, okay? Which is much better, bigger than this term here. So in first approximation, the here has a, in this language, it has a, the Bohr's magneton outside. The Bohr's magneton uh, divided by the electron classical radius gives this uh, coefficient here, which I think is missing on h squared. So uh, the kinetic energy is this term here, which is quadratic, okay? So now what I do, I go and solve uh, uh, the spin locking uh, equation and I find this solution, okay? Which I will discuss a little bit more in another uh, slide. So I have three coefficients because uh, um, it's a linear equation, one, two solutions, the sum of two solutions are a solution, okay? It decays away from the layer, above and below, okay? It flips signs, so the, this layer is some kind of uh, um, singularity, say, okay? Although things don't diverge there, but it's like a charge in an electromagnetism. You don't solve the, the electric field at the point where the charge is. Here we make physics around the layers and also in the layers in some sense, okay? So I have a volume that I introduced because of the dimensionality that uh, with a L3 direction, which is perpendicular, is interpreted as being perpendicular to the layer in an area of a unit cell in the layer. If I feed back, feed this solution into this kinetic energy, what I get is that the kinetic energy is proportional to the modulus of k, okay, which is two-dimensional momentum, okay, times these coefficients, which are interpreted as creation and annihilation operator, operators. So in other words, I'm just able to, sh to show you that a linear direct spectrum comes out of the traditional Schrodinger equation with no further doing, okay, just doing the correct steps. There's no um, other uh, assumption. So the solution that we found out is this solution here. This solution has to be interpreted. Okay? You have to understand you have something uh, above uh, the decays. It's a, it's, it's a solution that is not, this is not two-dimensional physics. It's nearly two-dimensional physics because the solution is really three-dimensional space localizing the layer. Electrons are not uh, fully uh, in the layer. They are dancing here, okay? And if I take this wave function, I can obtain the local field in space, okay? That's the local field in space. I can do the calculation. I can take a uh, Fermi field, uh, Fermi field uh, surface and obtain a magnetic field associated to these quasi-particles. And I'm giving you here a pictorial view, okay, of this local magnetic field. This local magnetic field is exactly like this uh, uh, view here. The stream lines, okay, they go through above and below the line. You have currents in the layer and also outside the layer, 
Okay? So these are two views of uh, what are the resulting solutions of this problem. Okay? Now, if I have such a solutions, and in fact, I can see that the local magnetic field H prime uh, is uh, always re removed of the, of the applied one, it goes, it pierces the layers twice, okay, one in the center and the other some point outside. So this is how the layer, the layer is. So I take this field H prime and I compute the Chan Simons index that determines the topo topological stability, okay, which is given by this expression, okay, and it's computed in the plane, takes the derivative x1, x2, the um, external product, then uh, internal product, okay, and what I find out is that this is an integer, and it has to be an integer because uh, I'm taking a unit cell in the plane, <clears throat> points x1 and x2 are here, Okay, and this unit cell is like a torus because the borders are identical. And each point of the, uh, in space has a direction of the field associated to it. Okay, so this is, is a mapping in, of uh, a torus into a sphere. Has to be an integer. And in fact, we compute and find solutions that are an integer. What's the meaning of that? That's, that's topology, okay? It's, uh, uh, Particles that have different cues that cannot be uh, transformed into the other ones. So this is very funny that uh, I find out solutions that uh, I don't know if they have the lowest kinetic energy. From the point of energy, perhaps they are not favored. But since they are not in this magnetic field space, they are uh, stable and they move uh, and define the physics. Okay. So we have done uh, some more uh, calculations and we are still doing it, okay? Uh, and we have found, for instance, this is a, something interesting. We have found fractional charges in presence of an applied field, okay? And in fact, we are, we are able to check that in two ways, either by plots of the local magnetic field or calculation of the chan Simons index, okay? So for instance, here are, is one solution. This is the local magnetic field, okay? We, you see here uh, the component, component H3 piercing the, the layer, okay? And you see uh, violet as being negative and red as being positive. So you see that it's coming out in the red part and coming in into the violet part, okay, which is exactly what this pictorial picture is showing. And if you look, make a cut yeah, along this uh, dark line here, okay, which is here, x2, x3, now perpendicular to it, what we see, okay, this is, is the local field uh, components h2 prime, h prime three, okay, in the plane x2, x3. Wh what we see is that the streamlines is exactly what we, uh, have, have here in this uh, pictorial view that resumes everything. Of course, the field decays away from the layer and becomes weaker and weaker, okay? If we look at, at the local field, okay, in the plane, above the layer and below the layer, we see that this is a sinkhole, which is a violet, it's entering, okay? The, the local field components are pointing in the plane, are pointing towards this point. And below, they are pointing out of it. Okay, it's a source. Okay, the currents are like that. And in fact, we have some accumulation of charges. This state also carries a spin density wave. Okay, but I don't have time to get into these details. So now look, we plotted, we, we put it here. Uh, physical particles, we, we put one, two, three, four, five. I am not explaining in details to you, but uh, you uh, please believe me that uh, in this formalism, in this unit cell, I can define the number of magnetic flux and particles in the unit cell. And here they are the same. So it's like I put one flux, two, three, four, five. When we go and, and try to plot the local field, 
age prime, okay, what we find is that here we have four objects. We have four sinkholes and also four <clears throat> sources of field because these uh, red balls here, they sum up to four. This is in this makes one, the one in the corner makes one, this makes one and this one, so it's four. And the same is true here. We have nine objects. Here we have 16, here 25, okay? So we have 25 objects, okay? When we go and compute the Chan Simons number, we get exactly this one, four, nine, 16, and 25, some negative numbers that we still have to understand. So in other words, we can see graphically or calculate through calculation that we have in the place we have put two particles, we have four objects. So it means that each object carries one over uh, two of a charge. Here is one over three, one over four, one over five. We are really astonished by this fact that uh, in presence of a magnetic field, we can observe fractional charges in this, from this uh, decomposition theorem. In conclusion, the spin momentum locking condition implies in the presence of a local magnetic field. That's a condition uh, that uh, from uh, the theory. Okay, uh, I would say that I could perhaps include an, another uh, even more important uh, conclusion is that it seems that spin momentum locking is something very important in topological uh, insulators. And this has been uh, said uh, 11 years ago. Okay, but the difficulty in measuring this is not simple. So people are not 100% sure that this is occurring all the time and why it's occurring. So here we are giving a rationale for this is because associated with it, we have a local magnetic field. The other thing is that the Rashba term, which is a spin orbit coupling is contained in the Schrodinger kinetic energy. We have thousands of papers that ignore this. Ah, this material, the Rashba term is very important in this. Okay, maybe you have an extra Rashba term. What's the extra Rashba term will do it? It will help the breaking of the kinetic energy in the, into these three parts, okay? So this is what I'm saying, the third part, symmetry breaking, an extra strong Rashba term just helps to break the kinetic energy into the three terms. The Dirac linear spectrum, it comes straightforwardly from this approach. You don't have to assume a Dirac equation, okay? And you can use the spin. There is the Vio equation, the true Vio equation in two-dimensional electronic systems, but it's not a Hamiltonian. It's a condition to minimize the energy. And the last result that I showed you is that the spin momentum locking seems to trigger fractionally charged quasi-particles in presence of an external magnetic field. That's all I had to say. I thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Mauro, for this uh, instructive and interesting presentation. Um, and now we open the questions for the audience. Who has questions? Um, while people are thinking, uh, would you like to ask a question for myself? So I found it interesting that um, you can derive the linear spectrum just using uh, the Schrodinger equation. You don't need the Dirac equation, right? That's um, right. And yeah, so uh, what I, I've seen sometimes, uh, I know that the electrons are not uh, relativistic, but sometimes people use a relativistic formalism because the linear spectrum comes uh, naturally from it. So we don't need to assume anything like this. Exactly. That's my point. You don't need to assume uh, um, relativistic. I, I find the relativistic uh, assumptions uh, don't make any sense in two, in two dimensional physics. I mean, unless it is a formalism, but uh, um, not as something fundamental because you, you don't have a time dilatation or um, uh, you, you don't have, I mean, the, the things of uh, special relativity, okay, on it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
I'm trying to go back to my the screen where I can see all of you. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, it has I can kit. see only small ones. Um, ah, okay. I, can, I should stop sharing. Okay, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, if I may ask another question. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that um, the bismuth is uh, quite weird and has some strange properties. Uh, yes. One of them is that the uh, the mean um, the mean free path is quite large, about one micrometer. Um, yes. uh, we can say that the electrons in bismuth are in the ballistic regime. They they move ballistically. Um, it's the opposite of hydrodynamic regime that you see in graphene. But uh, I mean, in, in uh, graphene, it is also ballistic, no? Electrons it depends, move, yeah. on, depends on the conditions, yeah. Uh, we can achieve it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, I, I don't know if this technically this word is uh, appropriate, but uh, it's true that uh, in, in bismuth, the electrons suffer almost, uh, I mean, uh, rare co collisions, okay? So they have a the, they could have a extremely large conductance. What uh, holds the, it down is that the number of carriers is not so, so large. So th there is something mysterious about bismuth uh, uh, because this uh, it's always appearing, it, it appears in different ways, uh, in different decades, in fact. Okay. Sometimes people even find superconductivity in bismuth. Now this, uh, topological insulators. I think that mm. uh, if you take, take my opinion, I mean, this is uh, just an opinion, it's not a calculation, is that bismuth has a strong spin orbit term. So you have the spin automatically coupled to momentum. And if you try to make collisions, these collisions, uh, they are protected because they are very costly. If you if you want to flip a, a change the direction of momentum, you also have to change the momentum the direction of the spin. I see. Okay, so it becomes difficult. To, uh, the collisions become very costly. Yeah. Probably they have a high cost. You know, probably the interaction is spin is spin forbids them to take place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Maybe. Okay, uh, more questions? So if not, let's think a model uh, for this uh, presentation. And yeah, let's finish the recording. <laughs>